God Saints, and welcome to today's broadcast from the Solid Rock, featuring Dr. Herbert B. Robinson, Jr. We are glad you joined us, and we pray that today's message will be an added value to your life. Welcome, my beloved, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to this segment of From the Solid Rock. Please join me in saying, my hope is in God, my trust is in God, my faith is in God. Please affirm that by saying this, I anchor my belief in God. God bless you. Please enjoy the message. Praise the Lord, saints, and welcome to From the Solid Rock. Glad you could join us today. And I hope and pray that everyone had a happy Thanksgiving, and that you spent time with family, friends, and ate well, and now you're looking forward to the end of the year. This is the family holiday season, and we want you to really enjoy yourself. I'm praying for you to have prosperity into your life and into your family, and you all have good health and strength, and that God will continue to bless you. Yes, indeed. Now, uh, we've been looking at Psalm 31. And the last time that we met, we looked at verses 1 through 8. And we start off by talking about how God has placed David in a large room, a safe haven, a place where David could rest assured that his enemies would not be able to get him there because God had delivered him. God will put you in an expansive place to do the things that are necessary to build his kingdom. And in that large place, there's plenty of room to do things for God. God doesn't keep us in those tight quarters where we can't move around and we're all boxed in, but God wants us to have freedom and liberty to abound in his blessings, to move about and enjoy life. I want to speak life into you today. I want you to enjoy your life. Find the God in you that can liberate you from tight places and feeling like you can't succeed or you can't go to another level. God is able to turn those things around. We learned in the first eight verses that David taught in this 31st number of Psalm that you got to trust God. And in trusting God, you have to show extreme confidence in what God can do. I do recall that David said in verse 7, I will be glad and rejoice. He may sound like he's being presumptuous towards God's deliverance, but God wants you to be in a place where you expect him to deliver. At least I do. I expect God to deliver because that's what God does. You don't go to a mechanic and expect him to perform surgery on your knee. You don't go to the psychiatrist and then expect the psychiatrist to do dental work on you. They don't specialize in that. God specializes in deliverance. So expect it. Now, when we look at Psalm 31, in this King James Version, I'm starting at verse number 9, because I was just really waiting for you to get your Bible, because I want you to read it for yourself. You look and see and read along with me if you like, so that you will see that this Word of God is good for all of us. When we pick up at verse number 9, it says, Have mercy upon me. I need to pause right there and just say simply, that is a cry of all of us. Lord, have mercy upon me. We need God's mercy. And if you don't think you do, that's all the more reason you need God's mercy because you're overlooking some things. And God is merciful. Bless his holy name. Back to the reading. It says, have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief. Yea, my soul and my belly. For my life is spent with grief, and my years with sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. 
I was a reproach among all mine enemies, but especially among my neighbors, and a fear to mine acquaintance. They did see me without, fled from me. I am forgotten as a dead man out of mine. I am like a broken vessel. For I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, thou art my God. My times are in thy hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me. For thy mercy's sake. Isn't that an interesting reading? Save me for thy mercy's sake. Save me because you are the deliverer. Save me because you are the redeemer. Save me, Lord, because you are my only hope. And then we go back to verse 8. He says, have mercy upon me. Sandwich between those two statements. In verse 9 where he says, have mercy upon me. And then in verse number 16, he says, save me for thy mercy's sake. Here David is calling upon God's mercy, not for his own sake, but because of the sake of God's name. Lord, if you're true to your name, have mercy upon me. If you're true to your name, come and see about me. For I am in trouble. We are always in trouble daily. And sometimes the trouble is deeper than other days. But trouble abounds in humanity. But it really increases when you are a child of God. Everywhere you turn, trouble on every level. Why? Because it's trying to pull you down. It's trying to pull you away from God. Here evil is reaching up to pull you down. Well, God is reaching down to pull you up because he is the deliverer. He is the rescuer. He is the one that can pick you up. And as they said in the church, turn you around. We want to know here today why David says, have mercy upon me for I'm in trouble. Why? Because mine eye is consumed with grief. David says, everywhere I look, I got problems. Everything I look at, it just sours. Every time I try to do right, I end up doing wrong. Every time I think I'm doing wrong, somebody pats me on the back as if I've done right. David says, you know, my, my, my eye is consumed with grief. I don't know what to do. And, and, and many of us are in that same kind of situation. We don't know what to do with what we're in. We don't know what to do with that problem or that situation. But we do know that God is the resolution. And that's why David says, have mercy upon me. Resolve this situation. Yea, my soul and my belly are messed up. The whole three dimensions of man is messed up. David says, my spirit is messed up, my soul is messed up, and my belly is messed up. That is to say that his heart is not right. That is also to say that his mind is not right. And also that his physicality is out of order. We are more likely to recognize when we are out of sync physically then we will recognize that we're out of sync mentally. Somebody else has to tell us that we are off our senses. Somebody else has to tell us that we're, can I say crazy? Yeah, we, 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 we are slow to identify that we have a chemical imbalance of the brain. We are slow to identify our mental shortcomings because we don't want anybody to tell us that we are crazy. But let your head hurt. Let your feet hurt. You know it automatically, right? But you can't recognize when that mental problem has caused you some grief. Now, here's the thing. 
It's the same way spiritually because we don't really recognize when we're sick spiritually. Someone else has to tell us. Someone else has to tell you that your spirit is out of order. You won't see it because you think you're doing right. You won't see it because you are so tied into your denominational practices. You won't see it because you think that you're righteous. But the Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. God shows you that your spirit is sick. The doctor has to tell you that your mind is messed up. That's, of course, if one of your family members don't tell you first. But anyway, only you know before anybody else when your body is not right. You can sense it. Hmm, something ain't feeling right. And then you got to find somebody who knows a little bit about it to tell you what's wrong. That's why I'm glad you're here with me from the Solid Rock. To help you to identify those areas where you might be ailing in your spirit. Because once the spirit is healed, it'll help you mentally. And I believe it'll help you physically. There's a story about when Jesus went and healed a blind man. And he healed the blind man's eyes. He said, what do you see? The man says, I see men as trees. God says, nah, that ain't what you're supposed to see. Because there were still some things wrong. And God says to look again. And then when he looked a second time, he saw things as they were. I said that to say this, that it takes someone else to tell us when we're out of sync spiritually or mentally. But we have to go to someone else to identify our physical ailments. Here David says, for my life, verse number 10, for my life is spent with grief. Here David is saying, my whole life is always something going on. It's always something wrong. Always. And my years with sighing. I'm just like every day for years. <sighs> what now? <sighs> what next? How do you expect to gain something out of life if you're sighing for years and if your days are filled with grief. I've come to tell you today, you've got to recognize the power within you to change that. Regardless of your situation, it can be changed when you trust in God and confidently go to him for what you need. Oh, he's a provider. David says, my strength faileth because of mine iniquity. There he is, he's confessing that I've self-inflicted myself and that's why my strength is failing. And then David says, you know, I was once strong, but I saw Bathsheba from a roof and I got weak. Many of you are going to have a Bathsheba moment. Men and women, you're going to have you a, a David moment. Bathsheba knew, Bathsheba knew that she was married to Uriah, but she had a David moment. David knew that it was Uriah's wife, but he had a Bathsheba moment. David says here in verse number 10, my strength fell is because of my iniquity. My strength to refrain from being with that man's wife failed me. It was my iniquity because she looked so beautiful to me. And here Bathsheba is saying, how could I resist this king? This man. Well, my man is at war. Watch yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Be careful. Be careful. The Bible tells us in the third chapter of Genesis, you got the lust of the eyes. The lust of the flesh and the pride of life will bring you down. It will weaken you. David says, to the degree that my bones are consumed. Here David's bones are feeling like 
brittle. Do you know what you become once all your bones are broken? Just a big gob of mess. When this endoskeleton is all broken to pieces, and I'm sure that David's just using this metaphorically, but he wants us to understand that when all these bones are broken, you just become a gob of a mess. We are gobs of mess because of our own grief, our own iniquity, problems that we have caused ourselves, and that's what we see here today. David says in verse 11, I was a reproach among all mine enemies. I was a reproach among all mine enemies. They came after me because they saw that I had a weekend. They came after me because they knew that I had no strength in my flesh. All my bones were consumed. David says, especially among my neighbors, those who saw me on a daily basis, those who I considered to be friends, they saw what I was going through, and nobody could help me. Nobody can help him. And I'm sure you've got neighbors that look at you and say, oh, I wish I could help them, but I can't do nothing for them. I can't pay their rent. I can't pay their mortgage. I can't pay their car note. Yeah, I got money in the bank, but that ain't my problem. That's their problem. And a lot of times we come into problems because of self-infliction, like I've said over and over again. There are jobs out there. And if one job can help you to make ends meet, have you tried working too? Oh, you got to have your leisure, you got to have your fun. I understand all that, but 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 at the end of the day, you still got to pay your rent, your mortgage, your car note, food on your table. I'd rather have, I'd rather have food on my table, and my bills paid, than to be out there having fun and giving my money away. The fun will come. Fun has been here for centuries. It ain't going nowhere. Take care of yourself, saints. Don't be a reproach to your enemies. Like David said, you know, even among my neighbors, they just shook their heads and said, no, David can't seem to get it together. He feared his acquaintances. And what did they do? They all fled from David. See, when you're a troublemaker, people will flee you. When you self-inflict yourself with trouble, people will stay away from you. Because they feel that if you hurt yourself, you'll hurt them too. And if you're a troublemaker, you're going to drag them into trouble. So sometimes, my beloved, it's not always the enemies that do us in. Because sometimes you can be an enemy to yourself. Mm-hmm. Put down that salt. Put it down. Why? Because that salt is going to give you high blood pressure. Now, ain't nobody making you eat that salt. Put down the pork. Yeah. 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 That high blood pressure you got from eating too much of it. You have bacon for breakfast. You probably had a uh, BLT for lunch. Probably had ham hocks or pork chops or ham for dinner. You got so much pork in you, you're self-inflicting your physical health. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with eating it, but too much of anything can hurt you. I just said that for those of you who continue to eat it. Help yourself. So David, this writer, you know what he says? Because of my iniquity, because of my reproach to my enemies, and especially to my neighbors, and even to the degree that my acquaintances fear me because they feel like I'm going to cause them some problems, he says in verse number 12, I'm like a dead man. I believe that's what he says. Let's read it. He says, I am forgotten as a dead man out of mind. People have forgotten about him. When was the last time you went to the cemetery to visit one of your loved ones? Hmm? There are people I love dearly to my heart. And I haven't even been to the cemetery. Why? Because they're dead. They're pretty much forgotten. Not in the mind and not in the heart, but going to the cemetery. I know they're not there. The body is, but the Bible tells me to live is Christ, to die is gain. 
The Bible tells me, he that believeth in me, although he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So, therefore, my beloved, the one that I love is not there. And so David says, I'm like a dead man. Don't nobody care. Nobody's visiting me in my personal cemetery. Nobody's coming to the mausoleum to lay flowers in front of the door. David says right here, you know, I'm out of their minds. I am forgotten. I am like a broken vessel. And a broken vessel holds no water. It holds no liquid. And so David says, I'm like that broken vessel where no one wants to fill me up. No one wants to fill me up with love. No one wants to fill me up with compassion. No one wants to fill me up with those things that can help me enjoy life. Jesus says, I've come to give you life, and I've come to give it to you more abundantly. It is he and he alone that can fix the broken vessel. He is our hope. God can take a vessel that's been broken into a million pieces and put it back together again, piece by piece, if necessary. But when he's finished, it's going to be better than it was before it was broken. And I'm here to tell you today, if you're broken right now, God can put the pieces back together again. You better believe what I'm telling you here, because David said, in God, I will put my trust. Put your trust in God and have confidence that God is going to deliver and that God is going to show up and that God is going to straighten out your soul, your spirit, and your belly. And I even believe that God can straighten out your finances. Many of you run to creditors to straighten out your credit score and many of you are in student debt and many of you are in debt because you get all of these credit cards that come to your house and they say, hey, here, we'll give you $2,500 credit. Hey, here, we'll give you $1,500 credit. Hey, here, we we'll give you $2,000 of credit. All that stuff adds up and now you're in debt. Now, how did I get on that? The reason I got on that is because many of our problems are self-inflicted. Tell that creditor, no, you don't want no credit card. Go on and pay off your student loan. Do the best you can anyway. I still owe. And if anybody wants to send me some money to help me pay mine, I welcome it. But do know this, that David says, I'm like a broken vessel, for I have heard the slander of many Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. Here David is talking about all these evil devices that are stacked against him. But not once does he mention the self-infliction that he causes himself. My beloved, you're self-inflicting yourself when you don't trust God. When you do not believe that God is a deliverer or that God is the hope that you need, you are setting yourself up for problems. You're setting yourself up to be destroyed. Let's read that verse again. For David says, for I have heard the slander of many. Let's just dissect this for a minute. He's heard about the individuals who have slandered him who have dragged his name through the mud, who have, 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 have caused him some grief because of the things that they've said. But did he mention that a lot of things he did was self-inflicted and gave people just cause to slander his name? If you are a gossiper, if you're a bully, if you're an intimidator, if you fit any of those things and you go to church and you are a Christian, you're giving people just cause to slander your name because you've brought things upon yourself. That's what David did. David says fear was on every side. Nobody wanted to be bothered with him. And if we keep acting as if we're perfect, nobody's going to want to be bothered with us. Look deep within yourself and see what problems you can fix on your own. God has given you that ability. As I said before, put down a fork if you think that you're overweight. You don't have to run and get the gastro surgery to try to stop you from eating. You develop wisdom by developing discipline and a willingness to do it 
your way. The willingness and the ability to fix yourself. I believe Jesus says, physician, heal thyself. And so then we get back to David here. He says, they took counsel together against me. David says, they're all against me. Everybody is against me. Not everybody. There's someone who loves you. But there's some people who don't want to be drawn into your mess. They don't be drawn into becoming collateral damage for your self-infliction. They see you hurting yourself and they've told you and warned you, but yet you continue to do what you're doing. I've given you fair warning here today to let you know that God is still in business of deliverance. But you've got to trust him that he can. I trust him to deliver me. I trust him to take me to another level. I trust him to even finance from the solid rock. For the number of years that we've been recording, we have not asked you for one dime because we're trusting God. Oh, but the time will come where God will say, hey, put a P.O. box up there. Hey, go on and sell the prayer cloths. Hey. Go on and advertise the anointing oil. Hey. Go on and burn the incense. But I'm here to tell you, you know, until God says it, I refrain from doing it. Because we are leading you to understand how God will deliver. We have a Mr. B from the solid rock. Because God continues to deliver. While the others take counsel against us, and devise a way to stop what we're doing, God keeps knocking down the door. If you only knew how many things I do aside from the solid rock, it would amaze you. My wife just shakes her head. It frightens her to know all the things that I've got going on. But this is important because it's global. There might be one person, one somebody, who needs to hear what we're talking about. And that's why we say to you today, through all that he went through, notice what David says in verse number 14. He says, I've taken the hits. I've got people all around me that don't like me. I've got enemies that are trying to knock me down. I've got neighbors who don't want anything to do with me. I've got family members that can't stand me. I've got problems here. I've got problems there. And then he gets to verse 14 and he says, But I trusted in thee, O Lord. But I trusted in thee. And that's what we're trying to get through to someone here today. Through all that you go through, you've got to trust God. When you see things going bad, just say, but I trust you, God. When you see that you can't make it, but I trust you, God. When the load gets too heavy and things don't seem like they're going to work out, but I trust you, God. He says in verse 13, thou art my God. I mean, verse 14, thou art my God. My times are in your hands, God. So deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from them that persecute me. So if there's anybody here today that feels like they're being persecuted, outnumbered, and there's no, nobody there to help you, you got enemies all around, your neighbors are against you, your family are against you, just remember this, trust in God. Because that's who your help comes from. God bless you. We hope that you were blessed by the message for the day, and we look forward to you joining us again at the same time next week. Have a great life and be empowered by saying, I anchor my belief in God.
What's up, everybody? This is your girl, Vicky Winans, and you're watching Bell Global Network. Grace and peace, family. This is Bishop Marvin Sapp, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. My name is Mike Duggan, and I'm watching the Bell Global Network. Hey, keep it locked. It's your boy, D. Hattie, watching the Bell Global Network. You know how it is. Hi, I'm Charlie Langton, and you're watching the Bell Global Network. Hi, this is Martha Reeves, and you're watching Bell Global Network.